Thank you very much, uh, Johanna, for everything, for the invitation, for all this kind of help, assistance. And let me tell you that I am a little bit intimidated. I was intimidated by reading the abstract and intimidated by the technological display. Uh, technology more and more is preventing us to think beyond thinking about what technology wants us to think. So that's the kind of intimidation and I will try my talk is trying to kind of uh, move away from that uh, that management and technological control of subjectivity. So I have a question, Joanna. I don't see you, but uh, I think you are around. Um, we have two hours initially, but now we have less, 20 minutes less. So are we respecting the two hours or we have to finish at uh, 12 my time or uh, 6 uh, p.m. your time? Hello? Can uh, Ava? Yes, or, or? I'm, trying, I'm trying to respond. Uh, can you hear me now, Walter? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Very good. Okay. So uh, I would stick to the 50 minutes of your presentation, if that's okay with you. And um, uh, if you need any, um, I, I, I don't know how this hybrid, in this hybrid setting, this is possible, but I'll try to give you a note uh, like 10 minutes before the 50 minutes are over. Is that fine with you? Well, yeah, I, I, I try to uh, talk about 50 minutes, but uh, if you wanted me to reduce it, I would just kind of cut. Oh, let's, let's agree on that, 50 minutes more or less. Okay, so I would start with, um, with a couple of observations in relation to uh, Johanna's presentation. Thank you very much for the presentation, but what you said before about the goal of the conference. So I will talk not about uh, globalization, but globalism is a huge difference. Globalization is make us believe that something happened and globalism uh, is uh, is the global design of a local history, which is the history of the North Atlantic. So, and that is connected to universalism. So globalism is quite important in my talk. The other thing that you say, Johanna, is about the changes. <clears throat> I, I agree with that. I mean, from, from South America, we have been seeing those changes uh, since the 70s. And we start talking uh, about that we are more and more in a change of era and no longer an era of changes. And I will talk later on about that. And the third point I wanna, uh, I wanna mention is, uh, you, you talk about the visual, and that is related to, uh, to universalism and how the conceptual, conceptual frames uh, um, make us see uh, what the frames uh, uh, are preparing a school in us to see. So briefly, we don't see what there is, we see what we see. And that is one of the principles of my talk. So I wanna, I wanna share the screen now. And okay, I think you see it, right? And I will uh, make it. Okay, I changed a little bit the title to, um, on the one hand, to remain within the boundaries, and on the other hand, <coughs> to kind of help what, I, uh, what I'm going to say. So, refiguration of uh, universalism uh, in a kind of philosophical way, conceptual way, but universalism in a conceptual way, way uh, went together with unipolarity, which precisely was the... Uh, globalist or global design since the 16th century. Globalization is just something that happened, that happened. The history just, uh, what we call globalization today is the last chapter we know of uh, an attempt to homogenize the world and, and that is what we call neoliberalism. So and the reconstitution and the reconfiguration of uh, universalism give us, uh, take us to pluriversality and pluriversality is um, decolonial and multipolar. So pluriversality in the realm of conceptual philosophical um, uh, sphere is, cannot be separated with the kind of geopolitical 
uh, disintegration today of unipolarity of Western losing hegemony and the opening up of multipolarity uh, in the interstate system and which has to do a lot to do with the change of era. So um, I, 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 um, I div divided the, the talk in uh, four blocks uh, and I will go quickly. It's not an argument, it's just identify issues that we have to think in my view about the question of universalism. And I hope that the commentator will uh, kind of assist me in making sense. So the question here is the world order before <coughs> and after uh, 1500. <coughs> so um, the question of universalism, you know, uh, began to be um, the, the translation of cosmos into universe. I don't think universalism or the universalism in the sense we understand it today was a problem in the Greek philosophy. But it began to um, become, uh, as you know, in the Middle Ages, and especially to, to make a long story short, St. Thomas, <coughs> the question of the universal. And it was okay to discuss the universal because during the Middle Age, uh, uh, Europe was constituting itself as Western Christianity. But that kind of universal was not uh, yet a totalitarian totality of knowledge. So they, if we talk about Eurocentrism before uh, 1500, it's okay because Europe uh, needed, uh, it had a right to see itself, I mean the people, uh, Western Christian Europe, to see uh, themselves at the center because everybody else does, uh, did. Uh, and that was a kind of we call on follows syndrome. So the question of before uh, 1500, the, the world order was uh, <clears throat> polycentric and non-capitalist. So there was no one single cosmology and civilization that impinges uh, and control uh, all of the other. The question began to change after. Uh, so. Uh, before 1500, the, the, this, the, 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 the conceptualization of each civilization uh, and kind of configuration of itself was also related to a specific uh, war order uh, before European hegemony, and that is uh, Janet Abulugot uh, map. So I think there was a lot of uh, trade and market, etc. But uh, Europe was really kind of uh, in the, at the margin of the activities uh, that was going on uh, at the time. So uh, that is what I want to say between it's okay that the Christian uh, discuss uh, uh, the question of the universal and universalism and the particular and all that, but that was within that kind of local history of what after the Renaissance was called uh, medieval, uh, medieval uh, Middle Ages. So the, the thing began to change after uh, 1500, and that is, uh, and that is the the problem we uh, are in today. So with the emergence of the Atlantic Circle uh, circuit, uh, the commercial circuit. Um, the world order began to change and the structure of knowledge and the conception of the universality of knowledge at, at that time was theological and then as you know in the, in, uh, in, uh, during the, uh, the enlightenment becomes secular and, and uh, uh, science and, and secular and science and philosophy began to dominate but the creation of the, the the colonial revolution began to, of course, impinge and move into the, uh, the structure of the world order before uh, European hegemony. Well, I don't have Africa here, but uh, in 1652, I mean, the Dutch and then the, the British uh, went to South Africa. I don't have it here because uh, Abu Lugo doesn't have it. But the question is that the structure of knowledge and the conception of knowledge uh, is piggyback into the kind of uh, military, <coughs> political, uh, economic, and at the same time uh, 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 navigational uh, 
uh, expansion of the market, of the kind of market uh, that uh, began to emerge here, that for us, and I would say for us, is how you think uh, after Quijano and the experience and the history of uh, South America. <coughs> um, so it's a, for us, it's a kind of historical foundation of capitalism. So uh, all that I said that, uh, up to this point, I think it was fantastically, um, beautifully articulated, summarized by Michel Rothrio in an article that I called North Atlantic Universals, Analytic Fiction. And let me just uh, go uh, into some specific quotation that, as I said, is a summary of what I'm trying to say uh, uh, up to now. Modernity is a murky term that belongs to a family of words we may, uh, we may label North Atlantic Universals. And that's it. Uh, I mean, um, <clears throat> democracy and modernity and, uh, uh, and capitalism and all of those terms that control us today are uh, North Atlantic Universal, and that is the problem we have today. And, uh, and the best kind of uh, answer to this kind of problem come from philosophers and thinkers that are thinking from other kind of, uh, from other languages and uh, memories and way of knowing and way of living that were kind of dis disturbed by uh, a, a European expansion. Just before that, I was listening to, uh, to a Maori philosopher from New Zealand that was precisely talking about that. And knowledge is not the concept that exists in Maori uh, vocabulary. So he was talking about equivalent concept, but uh, the question is not to ask what is knowledge in Maori because uh, that is irrelevant uh, to them. And if you say, uh, if you ask the question, what is knowledge for Maori? What is space for Maori? What is time for Maori? Space and time are all the kind of Atlantic universal. Uh, you kind of control and keep the universality of concept of knowledge, uh, space and time. So <clears throat> the second point here is the North Atlantic universal he said, I mean words that project the North Atlantic experience on a universal scale that they themselves help to create. So they talk about globalization, but in, uh, even today they, they, there are people like Carl Schmidt that they say, well, globalization but we, uh, is something, uh, a, a way of, a, a project that began in the uh, 16th century. <coughs> but, uh, that kind of concept that defined the centrality of Europe has been created by European itself and uh, projected to the rest of the planet since the 16th century. So North Atlantic Universal are particulars that have gained a degree of universality, chunk of human history that have become historical standards. So. I don't have time to go into this, but we have to question Hegel from here. Uh, to start from here and not to start from Hegel. Hegel has the right to, to write the, the universal history as he did, uh, but, at, this, uh, uh, but at, at that time it was a kind of consolidation, the secular consolidation of universal history that was already kind of uh, uh, told uh, by Christian, Western Christian theology. So the North Atlantic Universal appear to refer to things that they exist. That is what I say, we don't see what there is, we see what we see. To refer to things that exist, that globalization exists, that the space exists, that time exists. But no, they have a fictional existence, like the Don Quixote or Madame Bovary, they exist, but as a kind of fictional entity. So. They appear to refer to things as they exist, but because they are rooted in a particular history, in a local history, in a singular history, they evoke multiple layer, layers of sensibility, persuasion, cultural assumption, and ideological choices. So they come uh, to us loaded with aesthetic and stylistic sensibility, religious and philosophical persuasion, 
cultural assumption ranging from uh, what it means to be a human being to the proper relationship between human and the natural world. So that is the problem of universal. So the, in that sense, it's not the question is not an open question who's universalist, but who really introduce and use the concept of universalism. So I am not trying to say what universalism is, but what your universalism did and does. So in the change of era, we are changing the question. We are no longer, longer asking for what things are, uh, but what things, how things become to be, and, and what concepts, or, and, and what the concepts do rather than what uh, they are. So, uh, in that sense, uh, to relate to the, 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 the conference, space and time are two such a North Atlantic universals, as I said. <clears throat> so, what is common to all moving organisms, and, and that is something that I developed uh, unfold in, in the article that I, I wrote for uh, the volume that uh, Johanna and other people are. And, uh, and in this article, I kind of start from Aztec uh, philosophy, uh, Aztec concept of uh, organization of the world. So, what is common to all uh, living organisms are places, directions, and contours. It's okay that, this, that the Western call that the space, but that is again is not a universal, it's a kind of uh, particular. And duration, repetition, and counting, and that's what Kant uh, kind of uh, canonizes as time, but again, time is not an entity that exists, it appears to exist, <clears throat> but is a way that the Western uh, conceptualized duration, repetition, and counting. So spaces, if you put it in plural, are places, are places determined by the actors involved in kind of uh, their organization of place, direction, and contour, and duration, repetition, and counting. And these kind of uh, uh, places are already determined by the, the datics uh, in the languages. So that is, is impo it's important to uh, analyze the datic. It's not just in kind of Western languages derived from Greek and Latin, the vernacular European <coughs> modern languages, but what happened in Aymara, in Quechua, in Maori, in Urdu, Bambara, uh, Arabic, etc., etc. So that is the, the, the change uh, of era we are uh, experiencing is because people are kind of who were uh, uh, embodied those languages, uh, began to think from those languages uh, in, uh, in, in relation to the West because we cannot uh, eliminate the West. But there is a change of direction. So the change of direction is no longer uh, looking from the west to the rest of the world, but how the west of the, the rest of the world kind of reconstituting their own way of living, thinking, <coughs> vocabulary, etc. But they have to do it. We have to do it in relation with the Western vocabulary. So, <coughs> space and time are local, local, particular Western cosmological figuration, fiction. So uh, the question is, uh, well, when I talk about this, people say, well, what, what do you do with the digital and G GPS and all that? Well, the GPS is a, is a particular technological thing, but you cannot separate the GPS from the, uh, the cosmological frame in which uh, GPS and the digital operates. <coughs> so, hmm, okay. So let me now go to... Uh, I'm sorry for the typo. Uh, what universalism? Uh, universal. Uh, what universal does rather than what it is that which I was talking about. So uh, <coughs> what I was thinking, was telling about, uh, talking about uh, uh, until now was what began with the colonial revolution. 
the colonial revolution is the moment in which the totalitarian totality of knowledge that we call universality and regulation of knowing that is all the kind of disciplinary formation <clears throat> from the Renaissance University, uh, the, the theological, but also the humanistic, the trivium and the quadrivium, and then Kant uh, restructuring uh, the structure of knowledge in uh, the context of the faculty, and then uh, Humboldt uh, adding the, the question of national languages and national literature as, uh, as a particular national history, as a particular part of the kind of uh, university schooling. So that is the kind of the colonial revolution. It's not just a colonial revolution political and economic, but it's a colonial revolution epistemological. Uh, if we can say that way, I would prefer to say nociological because uh, epistemological is kind of limited to uh, institutional knowledge, why nociological uh, refer to all kinds of knowledge. <clears throat> but the, the colonial revolution not only uh, kind of destitute the, the school, the education that Aztec, Mayas, etc. have, <clears throat> but also kind of impinged in, 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 the, in, the, in the every in the everyday life uh, of the people. Uh, disarticulating and rearticulating their sensibility, uh, not eliminating it, and that is important because all of that is kind of uh, coming back, re-existing re today. So by 1500, the fortuitous European encounter with the New World was the inception of a radical mutation of the global order in all spheres of experience. Uh, so from 1500 to 1650, European migrants, uh, Euro migrants in the European uh, diaspora and settlements in the America first and then in Asia and Africa initiated the long journey of globalization, which is kind of the uh, enactment of globalism as a project of <coughs> homogenizing the world in every aspect of living experience, economically, political, <coughs> subjectively, and epistemic. And that lasts until today. So the question is that universality of institutional Western knowledge, the known, and way of knowing the regulation, the disciplinary regulation, which was achieved and constituted in the six modern European Western languages and their drinking foundation Greek and Latin language, theological, scientific, philosophical, aesthetical. Non-Western languages and knowledge, way of knowing and practice of living were destitute. Destitution, uh, destitution lasts until today, but is no longer possible to have just one way of enacting globalism. So that is what is the change of era is that the Western project of Westernization of the world from 1500 to 2000 uh, began to crumble. And that again is what I try to think and I published something already about it as a change of era and no longer an era of changes. So to give you a better idea of uh, to just an image uh, of what I was trying to say until today before 1500 and what happened since 1500 is that every kind of uh, civilization, culture, whatever, cosmology uh, coexist that were kind of um, uh, 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 pluritopic and non-capitalist. So we have the, this is, the, I, I don't have time to go into detail about this. Uh, this is how the kind of, uh, the, uh, the, the Chinese organized their kind of sense of direction and, and, and distance and, con and contours in relation to the center, in relation to the actors that were kind of uh, configuring uh, the direction, uh, the contour and the distances. That was uh, the uh, the Aztec and it's a very 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 admire. Uh, codex. Uh, also, I mean, this is a very complex articulation of what to go quickly. 
to, uh, to we talk about space and time and that which I, 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 I kind of argue in, in the article I mentioned but everything that the, the, du the duration uh, and the direction and the distances were kind of articulated in relation to the center. Uh, there was no concept such as space and time. Uh, as I said in the article, a student of mine wrote a dissertation, the Aztec didn't have, co didn't have a space and didn't have time, they have Tlacautli. And Tlacautli was a, was a concept, was a word that kind of encompassed direction and, du uh, uh, and duration and what is important here is movement, uh, not just duration and direction, but movement and that movement that organizes like a Utli in relation to the season, uh, in relation to where the sun rises and where the sun sets, etc., etc. And the Christian, uh, they have their own kind of uh, organization of uh, direction and contour that the famous a TO map and what they have and the center was uh, was of course uh, Jerusalem so and I, I can go uh, I can go on and on that was Ali Drisi uh, Ali Drisi uh, <coughs> it's a Muslim uh, cartographer and you see you see the Mediterranean here and you see Europe here and to make sense from the west you have to turn the map around and say oh this is the Mediterranean and that is uh, the Iberian Peninsula, and this is Africa. But for the kind of organization of what uh, they saw and the contour and the distance uh, for uh, somebody who was kind of in the Muslim area of the world, well, that was not the case. It was not this, where the sun, uh, where the, 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 the compass tell us where the north is. So when Ortelius fabricated this map in 1570, that was the constitution of Western modernity and globalism, and was the destitution of what you see, what you saw before, and uh, and other uh, other that I have uh, time to uh, to uh, to show you. So that's, uh, the, the map is a very a visual uh, example of what universalism means. Uh, and there is a lot to say about that, and I will say a little bit more at the end. But the question is uh, that after 1500, the, the planet is not like that. <laughs> this is the way that uh, European cartographer saw design the map and but by then uh, the 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 the, uh, the, uh, the political and economic infrastructure uh, the invention of the printing press I mean not the invention but the kind of the uh, the, the the printing press uh, uh, that was not an invention of Europe but that kind of was used to uh, to reproduce um, a lot of uh, books and, and narratives that began to describe the world from the perspective of Europe, and that's a kind of totalitarian totality of knowledge. And the map, of course, uh, convinces us that the planet uh, is like that. I won't go into the blue, uh, <coughs> the blue planet that uh, we've seen from space, but uh, that that is another another chapter. Okay, uh, so <clears throat> I am going a little bit uh, quick and I hope you it makes sense because I want to uh, remain within the boundaries. So block three. <clears throat> uh, so each, each block you see is a kind of a puzzle. You can have to put it together. I just give him block uh, of different aspects of universal so to uh, invite you to think about that. So, so there's a kind of interactive uh, presentation. So the block three, we all in the planet are experiencing a change of era, no longer an era of changes that I said at the beginning and I will say a little bit more uh, here. 
So uh, in this kind of uh, change of era, what we are uh, witnessing and experiencing uh, is the advent of the third nomos of the earth. Uh, I don't have time to elaborate here, but I'm just kind of here having a discussion with, uh, with Carl Schmidt's second nomos. Uh, second nomos uh, for Schmidt goes from 1600 to uh, 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 war, the, the First World War, uh, and for me goes um, until uh, 2000. But Smith was looking at the second nomos from Europe, and I am looking at what he understands as second nomos from uh, South America. <clears throat> and so I kind of articulate the, the concept of the third nomos of the Earth, that is the last chapter, I think it's the last chapter, one of the last chapters, in the latest book that uh, Johanna mentioned. And the third nomos of the Earth is, there are two trajectories, one is de-westernization and one is decoloniality. They are kind of entangled, but they will just try to separate it to understand what I mean by de-westernization and decoloniality. So Western cultural universals, which kind of philosophical conceptual, were propelled and uh, propel and piggyback it on Western political, military, and economic globalism from 1500 to 2000. That is the era of Westernization of uh, the world. There is an interesting book by Serge uh, Latouche that is titled precisely like that, The Universalization, uh, L'Occidentalisation du Monde, uh, that was published in 1989. Uh, uh, from 2000 to today, I'm sorry for the typos, the memories and energy of, destituted, of the destitute which never die are re-emerging in all a sphere of life and practice of living. So the question is no longer resistance because you resist, you lose the game from the beginning, you, doesn't mean that you don't have to resist. It means to be aware of the limit of resistance. Why the limit of resistance? Because you resist the rule of the game of globalism. You resist a game whose rule was set up by somebody else. While a re-existence means to the link from those rules uh, and began to kind of re create, uh, to re-emerge what was destitute and is re relevant uh, today. It's not going back to the past. It's bringing the past to the present, uh, knowing very well that westernization is in all of us in different uh, dimension of, uh, of our experience, knowledge, practice of living. So de-westernization and, and decoloniality are the two trajectories that are closing the era of changes of Western hegemony, uh, are closing unipolarity in the interstate system and universality in the sphere of knowledge, and are opening up, this is a change of era, de-westernization, which is interstate multipolar world order that we are already living in. See, the Western can no longer uh, advance the neoliberal project of homogenizing the world. Why? Because mainly China, but also Russia and also Iran, and before that the BRICS began to stop uh, that pretense. So de-westernization doesn't question capitalism or what we call the colonial matrix of power, but dispute who controls it. And the question of re-existence is also important here, because if you look at what uh, the politics, not just the, 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 the kind of the state politics and the economy and military confrontation on the uh, and the, uh, the technological and media war, uh, what they are trying to do is to reconstitute something that was destitute by the West. And you can see it, uh, there is a lot of 
uh, debate and discussion uh, going on and how Russia and China and Iran are not bending, are no longer uh, 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 accepting the dictates of uh, the North Atlantic, the United States and the European Union. Um, so, now, in a change of era, changes cannot be just prefixed with a simple post. Post, post this, post development, post democracy, post capitalist, post space, post, post human, etc., etc., etc. That is a vocabulary of the change of era. But the change of era, uh, it, that era of westernization, uh, the era of changes, I mean, has been constructed on Western North Atlantic universals. So the change of era that I see and uh, I am advocated in the sense of contributing to um, is the moment in which uh, the North Atlantic universal began to lose the universality. So the West and the United States and the European Union, uh, the West of Jerusalem, uh, not the West of Mecca and Medina, which is uh, North Africa, uh, are losing hegemony. And what we see, the losing hegemony, as Gramsci thought us, uh, is just uh, not losing credibility uh, political credibility, economic credibility, but also credibility in the universality of Western uh, knowledge. Uh, <clears throat> so, in, in that sense, uh, the, it's interesting to think about that because the, uh, the, the economic, political and military uh, loss of hegemony of the uh, North uh, uh, Atlantic uh, is compensated, as Gramsci told us, by domination. And we, we see today uh, the, for us, seems the desperate uh, move by United States to keep control of the global order with the European Union a little bit still undecided uh, to what extent uh, they will kind of continue to be served of the United States or kind of liberate themselves and approach uh, de-westernization. Something is happening but uh, the European Union I see it. and that in the geopolitical order is related to the kind of universal uh, the universals in the uh, sphere of knowledge that govern the way we think, the way we feel, and what we do. So in that sense, this, the change of era is no longer a transition. Transition is a concept that fits the era of changes. And when you can put the post and the uh, era of changes maintain what? <laughs> the universality of linear time and the universality of a Eurocentric concept of space. Uh, so the change of era is no longer a transition in the unilinear scheme of universal history, but an explosion of local histories, languages, memories, and practice of living that have been destituted during the era of changes. Uh, and the era of change for the era of universality and unipolarity. So, what the Westernization is bringing to us, if you remember the, the three the maps I showed you before, the Atlantic, <coughs> the war order before uh, 1500, the war order since 1500 with the emergence of the Atlantic uh, commercial circuits and all the consequence for uh, the, the area of knowledge, I mean the exportation of universities and the exportation of 
a school, convent, education, etc. Uh, and then the Orthelius uh, map that put the Atlantic in the center, and that is the moment in which the Atlantic displaces the Mediterranean as a center uh, before uh, before 1500. And I don't want to go too far back because uh, if we go before back, uh, the Atlantic was not the center, it was the Indian Ocean that was the center, but the Atlantic kind of managed to displace uh, the Indian Ocean and become a center <coughs> before European hegemony, uh, and then the Atlantic. But in the uh, change of era, the Atlantic is losing its centrality. Oh yeah, of course, we still have the <coughs> Greenwich Meridian that displaces Rome as a center of the Western world. Uh, or the, the Western image of the center of the world, uh, and now the Pacific and the China Sea are becoming, I don't know if the center, but the kind of the, where the scene is, the scenario, the action is uh, being played. So there is a reversible shift to the Eastern Hemisphere, and its planetary consequences. And the planetary consequences is not the, just the interstate global order, which is the dispute uh, I mentioned before between the United States and the European Union on the one hand and Russia. And, and I don't bring the Middle East because that is too complex to go uh, over in, in a few minutes. But we, we see that the reversible shift of the Eastern Hemisphere is rearticulating the global order. So the Belt and Road Initiative is already touching the Middle East and explaining a lot of things that are happening there because uh, of the dispute of the control of the colonial matrix of power between China on the one hand, the United States and the European Union. And we have to think about how that impinge. We don't have much to say at that order, in that order, we don't have much to say at the IMF and the Global Bank and Davos and uh, the G7 and the G20. So we are kind of observer of that. So, but the question we have to think is uh, how that touches us and what is our thinking and doing in this change of era. Walter, just if you can hear me, if you can hear me, Walter, five more yeah. minutes, it's okay. Yeah, yeah, I have, I want to finish at 11.15. Fine. Because I started at 10.25. Right? Okay. Your time, yes. <laughs> okay. So, uh, I, so the, the last block, is the, this is the last block. The conflicting coexistence of the change of era. Uh, but the de-westernization de uh, forces the counter-revolution, which is re-westernization. And that is what kind of initiated by Obama and is uh, go went through different ways through Trump and is going on through Biden. So what is important to keep here, uh, keep in mind here is interstate politics of re-westernization. Uh, is the counter-revolution to contain de-westernization. And that is being played at the political and economic uh, sphere and military, but of course that is based on cosmological and foundation, and foundation uh, frame of knowing and sensing. So China, for example, is not organizing the dispute based on Locke and, and, and Kant and uh, whatever, and Machiavelli, etc., but kind of reconstituting the, uh, the legacies of Confucius and Mencius and, of course, uh, Mao, etc. But what is important there is a kind of the re-existence, the re-emergence uh, of that kind of knowledge that was destitute. 
So, and that happened, I mean, uh, also in the national, domestic, and international interstate politics of re-Westernization. Uh, so, the mainstream media, the university, the museum, the school, etc., etc., etc. And I give you an example here, I think uh, because it's very telling, when Bruno Latour, a few years ago, organized a, a, a art, art exhibit and published a book, Reset Modernity. So, <laughs> resetting modernity, Latour doesn't want modernity to go out of his hands. So he wants to reset it. Uh, the using, of course, this kind of techno technological metaphor. What I mean with this is a kind of the re westernization is not only happening at uh, the level, the interstate level, political, economic, and military, but it's also happening at the cultural level. And that is what kind of affects us. <clears throat> so, closing. I have five minutes, <laughs> and probably I won't use the five minutes. Uh, <clears throat> closing and opening. If universality is the expression of the coloniality of knowledge, way of knowing, sensing, and believing that legitimize unipolarity, Westernization and globalism as a Western project of globalization, then pluriversality is the, uh, is the expression to understand the Westernization. That is very important. I am not promoting the Westernization. I am not enrolling with the Westernization. The colonial, the colonial thinking allows me to understand what is going on in uh, the kind of the dispute in the interstate system that implies not just, as I said uh, many times, political and economic, but a structure of knowledge and sensibility and the closing of the Western universe. Uh, so, the Westernization is already rearticulating a world order that is multi multipolar. Uh, but pluriversality, uh, for me, is to enact the coloniality of knowing, sensing, and believing. Uh, so my talk, in this sense, was intended as a decolonial enactment to reconfigure, uh, sorry for the typo, ours, and who are the we here, those engaged in the colonial enactments, was indeed a decolonial enactment to reconfigure sensing, sensing, believing, and knowing. That is our uh, decolonial practice of living. And in order to do that, we have to delink from uh, North Atlantic Universal and begin from some from someplace else. And that someplace else, there is not a model, there is not a universal decolonial. It depends on each of us in our local histories and uh, education uh, and kind of uh, training and embodiment of those local histories in our practice of living. Well, I went a little bit um, fast, but I did it in 15 minutes, and I hope that the and I hope that the commentator will help me to make sense uh, of what I presented to you in the four blocks. And thank you very much. <laughs>